What are numbers? Part 2. An incredibly complex amount of maths went into defining our natural numbers 0, 1, 2, 3, and it was vital that we left the way open to infinity. What is a number and how is it defined? If your last contact with maths was in a school classroom, the chances you won't see numbers in the same way a mathematician does. Mathematicians don't just study numbers, they study formal systems, abstract symbols and the rules for working with those symbols. The same basic rules have to be followed if groundbreaking new theorems are to be found. In this sense, maths can be seen as an enormous tree, branching off in all directions from a solid trunk. The rules mathematicians use to construct a new theory are called axioms. An axiom is a statement that is taken to be true, to serve as a premise or starting point for further reasoning and arguments. If you ask a mathematician, what is a number? She or he would probably answer by giving you the axioms that were originally used to construct our set of natural numbers. 0, 1, 2, 3. The rules behind these numbers, the numbers we use every moment of every day to tell the time, add up the bills and fill up the car with petrol, are known as piano axioms. The piano axioms define a structure that can contain all the properties of natural numbers, where n signifies the set of natural numbers. Let's discover how mathematical theory is built from these elementary rules. Axiom 1. Zero is an element of n. We assume there is at least one element in n, which we will call zero. Or rather, it will turn out that this number will correspond to our understanding of zero, but at this point, the only thing we've actually said is there is at least one element in this set and, strictly speaking, we have no reason whatsoever to associate all of our preconceived knowledge of zero with this element we just introduced. Following it, the next three axioms describe a function we'll call s for now. The purpose of s is to generate all the other numbers of our set, or to create all the other numbers if you will. We do this in a very subtle way, without even mentioning numbers or adding up. If x is a member of the set, and we know there is at least one, then s of x is also in that set. Up until now, we haven't specified what this function really does, but remember, we only want to lay out the bare minimum in these axioms. Now, let's look at this magical function, s. Axiom 3. s of x equals 0 is false for all x. No number exists such that the output of s is 0. Or in other words, if we start from 0, the number we know exists and apply s to it, s of 0, we will get another number. But we'll never ever go back to 0 again, OK? What are we doing here? Well, s of 0 is another number. S of S of 0 is also a number. S of S of S of 0 is a number, etc. The magical function S, as it turns out, is called the successor function. It simply allows us to go from one number to the next, counting them one by beautiful one. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. But hang on a minute. What if there is a number X? for which s of x equals x. If this number existed, we would be stuck at x, unable to generate more numbers. Infinity wouldn't exist, and we can't have that. We need numbers, so there had to be a fourth piano axiom. If s of x equals s of y, then x equals y. Zero is a number. s of zero is a new number. Thanks to Axiom 4, we can make an infinite chain of numbers by repeatedly applying S. Axiom 5. If a subset A contains 0, and if X is an element of A, and S of X is an element of A, then A equals N. 
Finally, welcome to our last axiom. The mathematical way of saying our natural numbers are the set of numbers we have just created and nothing else. In this sense, a number is like a word. As Humpty Dumpty said, when I use a word, it means just what I choose it to mean, neither more nor less. When we use a number, it means just what we choose it to mean, neither more nor less. Thanks to Axiom 5, only the chain created from 0, S of 0, is the set of natural numbers and nothing more. So, now you know. The beauty of mathematics is that something so seemingly mundane, such as natural numbers, can be rigorously defined in highly thought-out concepts. Then, from natural numbers, we can go on and define whole numbers, rational numbers, irrational numbers, etc. So far, the formal system we've been describing has been totally abstract. We haven't even said what the function s does, only how it should behave, and not even what the elements of the set really are, just what rules they are subject to. There is a way of making a mathematical structure that obeys these rules. In mathematics, that means we can make a model of this formal system. And since the model and the abstract formal system behave exactly the same, the two are isomorphic. That is what mathematicians say when they mean, for all intents and purposes, the same thing. Take a look at this thought experiment. Take zero to be an empty set. Now, let's define the function s. Take the input of s and put it in a new set. So, s of x equals a set containing x. What do the numbers look like in this model? Zero corresponds to the empty set. S of the empty set is a set containing the empty set and corresponds to one. Then the number one corresponds to a set containing the empty set. S of that is a set containing a set containing the empty set and corresponds to two. And two corresponds to a set containing a set containing an empty set and so on. Every successive number is like an onion with one more layer. This is one example of a set theoretical model for this formal system. Bear in mind that all of mathematics is based on more and more elaborations on fundamental axioms. It is a complex subject, but then the world is a complex place.